All right, let's look at some ears in regard to cytology. Sample collection. So taking an ear swab is one of the most economic, cheap, affordable, easy to do, easy to look at tests that we can do in-house for our patients. It's super common in-house, uh, super quick results, can often start treatments immediately depending on what's found on the ear swab. It's inexpensive. Um, we typically use swabs and you can do superficial and deeper samples depending on what the vet's seeing in the ear and you can do them with the use of an otoscope as well. So really just stressing the importance of doing this kind of testing in-house because it's so inexpensive and it's so easy to do. So your sample preparation, you can use one slide. You can be as um, wonderfully <laughs> cheap and fabulous as you want to be. You can use one slide for both ears. That's the best thing to do. Main thing is just identify which sample belongs to which ear. That being said, frosted, <coughs> frosted slides work best with a pencil and at the very base just down here you would write left and right and that's it. So cerumen, which is wax, can be fixed to the slide with heat if you so choose. If you do that, pass the slide over the flame, sample side up. Do not burn your sample. I've totally done it. Sometimes we lose track of where our sample is. Hence, it really helps in this particular case to label your slide ahead of time. So you just pass the slide over the flame two or three times. You don't want to do it too much because you can heat up your sample too much, destroy the cells, and you can also get a lot of black soot uh, type material on the underside of your slide, which you can wipe off, that's fine. Main thing, don't burn your sample. So staining, if you heat fix your sample, you can, we always use, as an aside, we always use a three-step prep for ear slides. If you have a heat fix sample, you can go directly to the pink, right, to the red, so to step two out of three. If it's not heat fixed, so if it's just taken directly from the ear, rolled onto a slide, then go ahead and start with the first step, so step one out of three, and that's the fixative but if you heat fix it, you don't need to use the fixative. And then rinse your slide off gently. Don't blast it. I will give you a heads up if you roll your slide too thick. Sometimes in the rinsing process, you see all the contents of your slide get rinsed off and down the drain. In an ideal world, we would rinse all slides with distilled water. We all know that distilled water is more expensive than regular tap water, but it does prevent uh, mineral staining and deposits. So this is the cytology of normal ear, and these are sort of things that you're going to get used to looking at. So what we're looking at are rolled up sort of dead keratinocytes. Okay, they look like cigars, rolled up keratinocytes that those little dots in the background, they're not bacteria, and they're not bacteria because they're all different sizes and different variations in color. Bacteria tends to be quite uniform. And it's just general keratinocytes, cell debris, not a lot going on. Sometimes it might show up as a little bit brown, a little bit yellow. This one, on the other hand, is very abnormal. So here we have a happy keratinocyte who is being swarmed by happy bacteria. Okay, so now the creatinocytes just pissed off and it's full of bacteria. So this is an abnormal ear swab and this is one that definitely would need some treatment, um, of course, pending the vet's approval and diagnosis, but this is one that definitely is abnormal. Lots of bacteria. Otitis externa is a huge issue with dogs and cats, but especially with dogs and it's inflammation of the external ear canal. And that can be inflammation. It can also be inflammation because of infection. So infection starting with bacteria, with yeast, and the skin gets extremely inflamed and red and angry. So sometimes they just start off with the red ears before the, um, the bacteria is really developing. So it's just the initial bacteria might be in normal numbers, but they start getting that red ear. And there's all sorts of reasons why they get this. Allergies is super common, whether it's seasonal allergies or those poor dogs and cats with food allergies, which are just extremely expensive to treat and impossible sometimes to find the right food. It's really, really tricky for owners who have dogs with allergies. 
Parasites can cause it. So if you think about um, ear mites living in there, they're going to cause inflammation of the skin within the ear canal. Microorganisms such as yeast and bacteria or fungus, foreign bodies, so if something's physically stuck in there. Trauma, hormonal abnormalities. Hormonal abnormalities, I'm mostly talking about hypothyroid. Really common for dogs who are lacking certain thyroid hormones to have... Um, they're more susceptible to get these sort of infections and inflammatory responses in their body. So really common with hypothyroid. Could be hereditary or immune conditions. Could be owner-induced. So if the owner is cleaning the ears too much, they're disrupting the natural pH in the ear. Or if they're just irritating the heck out of the ear, that can cause it. And then we also have tumors and polyps. So it's one thing that's one of many reasons why the vet always uses the otoscope to look down the ear canal and see if there's anything in there. Also, I forgot to mention anatomy of the ear, super duper important. Those dogs that have nice erect ears like typical German Shepherds, um, they don't often get otitis externa. However, dogs with floppy ears and really hairy ears, for example, the Cocker Spaniel, they tend to trap bacteria and trap moisture in their ear canal, which is like a perfect place for the bacteria to grow and develop. So it often starts just with a red ear. The dog might be shaking their head or cat or just scratching. I find cats tend to scratch quite a bit. So red ear, and then it becomes, this is disgusting, <laughs> becomes red and thickened and it can have oozy discharge. So this is clearly some sort of an infection going on. And then lastly, if it's chronic, that we tend to get ears that look like this. So ears with really thickened sort of elephant-like skin on the inside and in particular, and you can see it's all raw and just, or not so much raw, but just bare. So lots of um, uh, alopecia from chronic scratching, chronic irritation with the ears. And this is super common to see it like this, where it's really thick folded skin when it's been chronic yeast infections. Okay, where they've never quite been able to get yeast under control and they get that thickened elephant skin. This isn't a fabulous picture, unfortunately, but these are polyps. So this is a cat. Polyps happen way more often with cats than they do with dogs. And it's this weird pendulous um, uh, little tumor, <laughs> weird pendulous tumor that starts in the middle ear, in the middle ear, so way down if you think about anatomy back way into the middle ear and it starts there and it grows outwards so it grows superficially and it becomes quite bulbous as it grows out and it can actually block the ear canal altogether. Now sometimes these little guys too you'll get a head tilt with them because it's affecting the balance so the semicircular canals it's affecting the the fluid that's within those so they can actually grow around within the ear and affect the balance of these little guys so they might end up with a head tilt and look neurological which is also the case with really severe ear infections too. They can look like a neurological cat or dog. But in fact, it's because otitis externa has shifted into the uh, middle and inner ear. Anyways, that being said, polyps are literally blocking the ear canal. So they're keeping moisture, they're keeping bacteria, keeping yeast within the ear, and can result in really nasty ear infections. Polyps can be removed, most definitely, through surgery. Um, there's always risks with that depending on where the polyp is, how far down it goes, how big it is. Uh, that being said, yeah, sometimes they can cause some neurological damage or some paralysis to the face when they're removed. But they're really interesting. They tend to just most often, I've only ever seen them in cats. All right, so looking at ear cytology, of course, we're going to have epithelial cells in there. So we'll have normal epithelial cells that are keratinized. Um, just meaning especially that they are the old uh, intermediate or superficial uh, keratinocytes. They can be anuclear, they can be basophilic or clear, and they can be cigar-shaped or clumped together. They can be a great haven to locate bacteria as well. Bacteria often climbs onto them. Speaking of bacteria, we can see rods, cocci, or both in either or both ears. Not all bacteria are pathogenic, so some bacteria is normal. All of our skin has normal amount of bacteria on it. That being said, if it's normal bacteria, how do we tell if it's going to cause a problem? Or <clears throat> if it is a factor that's actually causing the problem. 
So our distinguishing factors that we look at when we're looking at uh, cytology are the numbers. So small numbers of bacteria, they're pretty normal in most dogs and cats. The morphology, staphylococcus, are relatively normal in most dogs and cats. However, if you start getting into rod bacteria, it's not quite as normal to have rod bacteria growing in the ears. And then looking at the neighborhood. So what else is going on, right? It's kind of like when we talked about histopathology. How are those uh, organisms interacting with the cells around them? So in this case, are there white blood cells visiting to clean up the trouble? So has there been a response by the body to say, hey, I'm overloaded with bacteria in the ears and they send in the white blood cells? Or is it strictly bacteria? That being said, if you see white blood cells, always, always, always look in the white blood cells to see if bacteria is being phagocytized. Likewise, some bacteria has really particular smells to it, such as Pseudomonas. Pseudomonas is, oh, it's really disgusting when you see it in the ears or if you just see it on the skin. It tends to be really thick discharge, um, sort of like creamy, whitish, yellow, and it just smells sickening. <laughs> it smells sort of sweet uh, almost, so sort of like a warm bacteria sweet smell. So it's really really intense and it's really stinky and it's really common to associate Pseudomonas with its smell. And of course if it's a Pseudomonas bacteria it can be difficult to treat and it's definitely abnormal in the ears. So if you're still not sure if it's pathogenic, so if it's going to cause a problem or not, under 40 power, the following numbers are considered acceptable 4 to 24 in dogs and 4 to 14 in cats. If we're going to report this in the file, which of course we will, you tend to flip it to 100, so to oil inversion. 1 plus is rare to scatter, 2 plus many in every field, 3 plus difficult to count, and 4 plus too numerous to count, so almost entirely bacteria on the sample. I know it's subjective, so you just do your very best. There's not going to be a specific objectivity to it. And then, of course, culture and sensitivity is definitely recommended if uh, an animal has an ear infection in general before they're given an antibiotic. Even if it's their very first ear infection, technically they should have a culture and sensitivity done to confirm, to confirm what type of bacteria it is. And the whole uh, consequence of not doing culture and sensitivities and just prescribing antibiotics are those nasty antibiotic resistant bacteria, which are really common if an animal has a chronic ear infection and we keep using the same antibiotic. You can just start to develop bacteria that just <laughs> gives the hand to the antibiotic. It's just not happening. Okay, so this is a swab and you've got lots of nice beautiful cocci bacteria beautiful look at, not so great for the dog, and then these really ugly degenerate neutrophils. Neutrophils, you say? Oh yes, these are neutrophils. They're degenerate, and we'll talk about them in detail during inflammation. Okay, more happy, beautiful little cocci. And then we've got some rods around a cratinocyte. Yeast. Yeast is really common to find in the ears as well. It's Malassezia species. Normal in the majority of ears, so 96% of dogs, 83% in cats. And again, to identify whether it's normal or not, you look at it at 40 power, and it's 2 to 4 in dogs, 2 to 11 in cats. Same way to report on 100 power, 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus, 4 plus yeast. And it's really important to identify when you're looking at an ear swab, you're not just assuming that there's yeast and bacteria, that there is in fact one or the other or both, because certain medications will only treat yeast, certain medications will only treat bacteria, and depending on the veterinarian's preference, oftentimes they'll choose one uh, specific, for, obviously, that's the most ideal, is to choose one that's specific for the problem at hand, rather than just giving broad spectrum and hoping it will capture everything. Again, trying not to create a resistance. So we're looking here, this is a typical ear swab. It's been stained in the three-step stain. You've got cratinocytes with some wax on them, just sort of cellular debris, rolled up cratinocyte there. And then this is yeast. To me, if we get a good yeast, let me see my next picture here. Yeah, for me it always looks like, I always think of, I don't know if it's Inspector Gadget or Pink Panther, but it's always a detective shoe. That's, I don't know why, that's what I think about it, like a man's shoe print. So that's the way I think about it. Some people think about it as little snowmen or snow people. 
Um, but for me, it's always a detective shoe. And then lots of keratinocytes in the background. So those are superficial cells, intermediate cells, all keratinite. Uh, keratinocyte, fam. Okay, lots of yeast in this sample, definitely. All those purple little buds. And yeast is, uh, when it looks like the detective shoe, it's budding yeast. Otherwise, you can just have a singular uh, little ball of non-budding yeast. Okay, again, little yeast bodies kicking around on a keratinocyte. Now, the other thing with ear swabs that you might see are ear mites and other parasites. We are not going to talk about those in cytology. Those are for parasitology only, so I try to stay away from those. However, where it becomes interesting for us is if there's an inflammatory reaction because of the parasites, and then we'll start to see all the white blood cells. But otherwise, just plain old parasites, we are not interested in cytology. So another finding in the ears, you might see some white blood cells, and upon seeing a white blood cell, it switches from infection, so just plain old bacteria, yeast, fungus, etc. That on its own, we consider it infection. If white blood cells are now called onto the scene to try to get rid of the foreign invaders, it's now called inflammation. So it's an inflammatory response brought on by the infection. So it switches into an inflammatory category, and we'll talk about those categories in depth in class. So mainly neutrophils and macrophages are what you'll see in the ears in an inflammatory reaction. 40 power should be fine. When present, be sure to look for phagocytized bacteria within the cytoplasm. I can't express how important that is because if you're seeing a ton of white blood cells and you think you're not seeing any bacteria, look again, and then look again, and then look again. Because if there's bacteria, it's a completely different treatment, totally different ball game than if it's just plain old white blood cells. White blood cells might come out on their own without any bacteria, without any yeast. It's not uncommon, and that's just basic inflammation. And that can, because, uh, can be because of a lot of reasons. It can be because of hormonal imbalances or just a moist environment becomes irritating or the dog or cat is scratching at their ear. You'll just see some inflammation. So just, sorry, I, I might not have explained that well at first. White blood cells don't always come out because of infection. They can be seen as a response to infection, in which case you'd see some bacteria, white blood cells, or some yeast white blood cells. Um, but they can just be there on their own as well as an inflammatory reaction. So these are macrophages. Those are those happy little um, peripheral blood monocytes that have shifted into tissue and are moving around the body to clean up. Okay, they, they when you see them, it is an inflammatory reaction. Okay, and that's a neutrophil kicking around. So here we've got beautiful bacteria inside neutrophil cytoplasm. Super important to notice. Okay, again, inside cytoplasm of a neutrophil, these are all neutrophils, so are these. They're degenerate neutrophils, they're angry, they're dying um, because they're fighting. This is a super degenerate neutrophil. I just want you to wrap your mind around it a little bit, and we'll talk about it in class, in depth. But these are what neutrophils look like in cytology. <laughs> but just note, there is bacteria in the cytoplasm. Okay, and I think you can see the bacteria in this photo pretty well. Exceptional amounts of rod bacteria. And again, these are neutrophils. Okay, so wrap your mind around it. They're not the happy little peripheral blood neutrophils. These are thinned out, angry, dying neutrophils. Okay, they are losing their battle. And that is it.